All right, got audio, got video. All right, welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I typically do on Sundays. This one will be on a Wednesday. I'm a little bit behind. I was in Baltimore last week at the uh, Mance show, which is a Baltimore nursery show. It's usually, it's the first week of January every year, and it's usually the biggest kind of nationwide nursery show. It's uh, garden centers and uh, landscapers and others go up there and um, a lot of the most of the biggest nurseries in America are represented there uh, this year um, you know because the world continues to be a little bit upside down wasn't quite back to what it, its old prestigious self but it, it will be uh, soon enough I was up there helping the Southern Living Plant Collection and Encore Azalea set up their spaces and break down their spaces and and then meet um, other people uh, that I haven't met before and uh, reconnect with people that I've known for a long time and I think I've set up some exciting content, including a big trip out to California later in the year to visit probably the largest nursery um, in America that you guys haven't heard of. You're going to try to guess what it is, but you probably haven't heard of it. Um, but uh, so that should be super exciting. Uh, um, I did I did get sick while late in the week uh, in Baltimore and uh, um, brought that home. I'm past that. Everything's fine. I made the mistake of putting up a post about it. Um, <laughs> on the channel that many of you uh, commented on, made very nice comments, thank you very much. I removed the post because, you know, silly me to think that you could put a post up on a, uh, about a personal issue on, <laughs> on YouTube or Facebook or anywhere and not have it become uh, political and everything else. So I took it down. This is a gardening channel um, and uh, let's, let's keep the comments and the questions and everything to gardening because that's one area that we can all communicate with one another. Uh, in a civil in a civil way, so um, uh, my mistake. Uh, but I am better. Um, uh, fr throat's a little froggy. That's about it at this point. But I feel great. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'll get back on target with these Sunday uh, garden question and answers on this Sunday. So ask questions down below this video. Um, I am going to be getting some compost for the vegetable garden here. You'll see a video for that next week. I had talked about this year having the, the garden be a closed loop, meaning I wouldn't bring anything new into the space. I'm basically going to make that February to February. I meant to compost that vegetable garden uh, before the end of the year uh, for this next year, and I wasn't able to get to it, along with a couple other things I need to do. Uh, the broccoli and everything that was out there finally has just been torn out, but it was... It was uh, it should have been cleared out long before that. It's finally cleared out, so I am going to compost that space. So we'll start from that day going forward, and I'll talk about having a closed loop, meaning I'm not going to bring any new material, uh, organic material, onto this property. I'm going to create it from the things that are growing in the landscape. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that during the, uh, during the growing year. So let's get to some questions from last Sunday's video. Again, thanks for participating uh, in these. Uh, somebody asked me how long it takes to root uh, blueberries. I had um, I have a whole series on blueberries, including how to root them and and, and grow them in all stages, uh, con and containers in the ground. However, uh, blueberries aren't the fastest rooting thing. If you if you try to root them in, uh, I would say June first to about July fifteenth. That's probably the fastest time of the year that they root. But uh, even that time of year, they're not the fastest thing. It'll take a couple of months. Um, my phone is making noises. I don't want it to make noise. Why is my phone making noises? I pride myself on my phone never making noises. Okay, now it will not make any more noises. Um, but that time of the year in the uh, early summer, they root the fastest, and even then it takes about two months. You might get a couple little hairy, you know, they're very tiny roots. If you've ever dealt with uh, blueberries, azaleas are this way too. Everything, um, um, all the ericaceous plants have little teeny tiny fibrous roots. You may get a couple little fibrous roots pretty quickly, but in order to root out into a cell, uh, a transplantable size, it will definitely take a couple months, maybe more, um, even longer if you're not doing it during that time of season. Okay, somebody asked me about uh, uh, how landscaping around their HVAC uh, unit. Um, I've got mine over here, and I've just got I've got a giant bed that comes out from it, so I don't. It wasn't a very specific, you know, put a few things around an HVAC unit. I actually created a giant bed. I would recommend you do that anytime you're trying to hide something. So 
like mailbox plantings, which I never did. I, as a landscaper, I never, I tried to avoid that at all costs, putting things around mailboxes, because the mailbox is about the ugliest thing in your yard. It's weird to draw attention to it. Uh, if you, a, a black or dark colored mailbox is a great idea. Just, you know, just kind of make it blend in without it being seen. But if I do make a mailbox bed, I make a giant mailbox bed so I can pull people's eyes away from the mailbox. Same thing with uh, electric boxes, telephone boxes, you know, all those kinds of things. If you just put three plants around an electric box, all I did was make everybody look at the electric box. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what you do. So be careful with that. Uh, sometimes it's best to either just leave them be. I had a cable box at the old house that was in my turf. I just left it. Uh, it was green. Uh, matched the turf well enough. Obviously you could see it, but it wasn't, if I had gone and planted three shrubs around it, it would have just been weird. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind. When I did have HVAC units that the customer wanted to hide, I have built small low fences where the you know spacing between the wood is important. You don't wanna, you, you, the, that unit needs to breathe. But I actually had all the three panels on the fence little u-shaped fence around it um, out from it a bit to give it some space but i had the three panels where they would slide out uh, so that the repair cert, you know could be repaired it could be um uh, you know a repair person could get in there easily just by sh pulling out the three panels so there's that if you wanted to put a small fence around it but i would encourage you as much as you can to make large bit if you feel like you need to landscape around something like that make a very large bed and then put like a key item way away from it. You know, a weeping tree or something super interesting. And then they look at that weeping tree rather than, you know, at that box. But if you put three things right next to the box, you just drew their eye right to it. Okay. Um, somebody asked me, they've got liriope encroaching or monkey grass encroaching on their camellias. And would that be okay? An old established camellia probably wouldn't mind ground cover grass is growing up underneath it. Probably won't grow very well up underneath it by the time it gets there anyway, that uh, camellia, it'll probably be too much shade underneath the plant, but um, kind of concerning though that you have a, an encroaching liriope. There are a couple, there are two different types of liriope, or there are a lot, of, a lot of different types of liriope actually, but the two main ones sold off the, off the tables at, at garden centers and uh, Lowe's and Depot are liriope muscari, which is a clumping liriope. That's the one I would encourage most people to get. It's an ornamental, you know, it's just the clump gets slightly larger each year. You can pop it out of the ground, divide it, give it to friends, throw it away, whatever. And then there's liriope spicata. It's the one that trails under the ground and just goes absolutely crazy. I've literally seen it crack sidewalks, go all the way under sidewalks and pop up on the other side. A really nasty plant. And there was some of it in this landscape and I'll probably never, um, I mean, never is a long time, but they'll, it'll always be popping up back here. It's really, really hard to control. So uh, uh, that would be my main concern is that you don't want liriope spicata in your landscape typically. Um, it will create long-term problems. So if you have a creeping liriope. Okay. Um, somebody asked me about service berry pruning. I'm going to prune mine in the uh, front landscape uh, as a part of a pruning video toward the end of February. So uh, if you'll hold on for that. Um, huh, mine is small and skinny and spindly. It's going to be like four cuts, but I'll talk about those four tiny cuts uh, when that happens. Somebody asked if bone meal is important uh, when they're planting because the garden center they go to tries to sell them bone meal. Bone meal is uh, high in phosphorus and also calcium uh, as well as you would expect from bones. Um, and they are important for plants. Uh, uh, one is a, a macronutrient and one is a considered a minor nutrient, but I think calcium's just as important as the, uh, as the big three. Uh, and has a lot of, calcium actually has a lot of impact on soil compaction. Uh, it's a big nutrient um, as, com as compared to other, other uh, as compared to others. And uh, it can have some impact on creating a, a kind of a more fluffy soil. Only if you need those two nutrients. And this is something I've said, <laughs> you know, in the, throughout this channel is don't put anything down uh, on your landscape other than a general basic, you know, like I, you'll see me use plant tone or whatever toward the end of February, just a really basic fertilizer with a small amount of micronutrients as well. Just a good balanced fertilizer once a year. Other than that, 
Um, I won't go. I don't go specifically add phosphorus or, or or potassium or calcium or magnesium unless I actually need it. So that would be based on a soil test. I doubt if you're. Most of you watching this probably don't need to add uh, anything. You know, a small amount of comp a small amount of compost that's getting mixed in when you plant because you've got broken down mulch in the bed or whatever. All those things are mostly adequate, um, and, and very few people need it. Um, so, uh, you know, do you need phosphorus or calcium? Maybe. <laughs> That's the answer to that. You can get a soil test done and find out if, if starter fertilizers would be beneficial to you, which is, you know, phosphorus-based fertilizers. Um, okay. Uh, but again, I, I, it's doubtful. If you just keep, again, I, I always break this down to something really simple. If you're adding leaves and adding mulch and, and continuing to top dress your bed and giving your bed, giving, you know, basically feeding from the top down with organic material, most of you are not going to have to add uh, anything other than like, again, I, once a year. And I can do without that. Um, I can certainly do without that. And I'm going to do without it this year. That's going to be part of my closed loop system. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, somebody, asked, okay. Somebody asked me if they can use their pine stump grindings uh, for mulch. Uh, I, when I got the maple taken out of the front uh, front garden space, um, I actually just left that the stump grindings in place and I just mulched over it and I let it break down for about six months before I started planting out there. That's all I did. I just left it in place, covered it up. Uh, if you feel like you need to use some of that material and spread it out around the yard, you absolutely can. Um, like you said in your question, though, it does have a lot of dirt mixed in with it. When the stump grinder is grinding the stump up, it's not just hitting all wood, it's also hitting soil. So if you're spreading that material around and top dressing your bed, you're almost certainly bringing weed seeds with you as you go. So if you use it to top dress, you probably need to top dress over it as well just to seal in those uh, roots. The soil's not a problem other than the weed seeds in it. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. You'll be spreading weeds all over your landscape. Um, uh, somebody asked about slope ground covers. They're in zone 8, which is I'm close to. I'm in 7B, but probably 8A, honestly, in here in the city here. They're on zone 8, have a slope. Want to know some things that cover up the slope. Um, certainly suckering plants are something that you want to think about. So uh, a native suckering plant would be something like um, uh, clay, uh, uh, clethra. I have clethra in the front yard. You can look up my videos for clethra. It's a native suckering plant, meaning that it, you know, um, uh, grows underneath the ground and, and spreads as it goes. Itea is another native um, suckering plant uh, that would work very well for you. Uh, Virginia sweet spire is the common name for Itea. Uh, Non-native uh, forsythia, um, you know, some of the new lower growing compact forsythias would work great on a slope like that. Uh, suckering plants, I would consider my friend um, on a slope, I would say cotoneaster. It's a little, probably a little hot in zone uh, where you are uh, for cotoneaster. Um, let me think. And then, of course, grasses, uh, liriope, like we just talked about, but don't get liriope spicata. And then, you know, and then other types of grasses, miscanthus, penicetum. Well, I'm pretty sharp this morning, considering. I'm <laughs> uh, uh, actually, I, so, sometimes I sit here and go, oh, what is, what is that? What is that? Um, uh, Mullenbergia, uh, mully grass, uh, will work on your slope. And then, um, Lower growing things are obviously going to be like junipers, flocks, um, you know, your ground cover flocks. So there's a, there, there are actually a lot of options. And I like spreading plants and not just suckering plants, like ones that send up new shoots, but also plants that just get wider, like a low growing abelia, um, like uh, the radiance abelia, miss lemon abelia, uh, so that it's a plant that gets three or four feet wide pretty quick in a low dome. Um, those will be helpful on the slope as well. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know about a lilac uh, for my area. Just for those of you who don't know that live up in the north, we can't grow lilacs down here very well. There are only a few that do. They need a certain amount of chill hours in the winter time that we don't typically have down here or, or, or too variable. And so uh, the lilac I have in this landscape is called Miss Kim. Uh, it's a small leaf uh, lilac um, that uh, that works well here and is um, very reliable. I, I would say that nine out of 10 seasons, uh, that thing colors up, um, that thing colors up big time. And I had one at the other house. There's a variety called, um, oh, was it Palo, uh, 
that uh, palabin. Palabin, that's the other one. Uh, it's a larger leaf one, probably a more tra slightly more traditional looking lilac. That one needs low chill hours as well. Um, I'll, I'll have listed those at the bottom. Um, uh, but I would say there's probably three or four well-documented varieties that we can do uh, in the south here. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked about an insect and disease video. I did a video on preventing a lot of insect and disease issues um, uh, back at the old house. I think it's like 10 tips for, um, you can look that video up on the channel. If you go to my main channel page, you can look that uh, video up. Uh, uh, I don't have a lot of issues out here to do um, that kind of video. Again, I want to keep promoting that the more species that you have in your landscape, that means the more variety of plants, and all these birds that you hear in the background are part of that. There are also species that are in my garden. Uh, and uh, all of the creatures that live here uh, are part of a system. Uh, the more that you have, the more different things that you have, the more likely you are to have the solution hiding in your own yard uh, to the problems that you have. Um, as an example of that, great example of that, the uh, white uh, cabbage uh, butterfly. Uh, last year, the first year I was growing broccoli over there in that garden, uh, that white cabbage butterfly was out here on all my flowers all season. As soon as I planted my brassicas over there, brassicas are plants like um, Brassicas all evolved from a simple little cabbage plant in, 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 uh, in Great Britain. Um, it, it, and then it, it jumps over into Europe and uh, Europeans created from simple little cabbages, they created broccoli and cauliflower and kale and uh, so on and so forth. You can probably name 10 other brassica plants. They're all related to cabbage. That group of plants, brassicas, um, uh, have, a, have a little cabbage uh, a cabbage butterfly lays a caterpillar on the um, on their brassicas that eat your brassicas they're that they go hand in hand in Europe and they go hand in hand here in the states as well but that little white butterfly that you see toward the end of the season floating around when I put my brassicas in um, uh, they quickly go over there and start laying um, laying on it Last year I covered it with a cloth and then I was considering, I didn't know what I was going to be able to do because I have all these flowers out here and so I'm constantly going to have this as an issue. This year I said, okay, I'm not going to put a cover on it, I'm just going to see what happens. And because I invite all these birds into my landscape, the sparrows showed up and cleaned house. And I had the best broccoli I've ever had by doing nothing. Now the first year I, took a lot, I would have taken a lot of damage. The second year the birds figured it out and I don't, you know what I mean, I, I know going forward now just leave the thing uncovered. The sparrows will come in and do that job for me. They know where it is now, and they just spent all day in there cleaning those things out as fast as they could lay those over there. And so I had a small amount of damage on a few things, but best broccoli I've ever grown by having lots of different species blended in together in the space. So uh, keep that in mind. That's something I, I really want to get through to folks. If you plant nothing but azaleas or something like that in your entire yard when if you get an issue then what's going to you know there's no solution for it in the rest of your landscape okay oversimplified you'll still have problems um no, i'm not saying that you won't have problems by doing that but you will have far less problems having a very diverse landscape okay um uh Somebody asked me about what rose I have in my yard. I have a rose over here called It's a Breeze. It's a ground cover, a uh, red rose. It's probably in a hair too much shade over there, but it's done great, uh, very disease resistant. Uh, been fantastic. I haven't had any problem with it. It was blooming right up until almost Christmas. Uh, it has stopped now because it's, I think it's 25 or something this morning. Um, but uh, yeah, I would highly recommend that plant. Again, a plant, I mean, we all know roses have problems. Um, Roses as a group, uh, the whole rosaceae, the whole family of, that roses belong to, uh, which would be roses, that service berry that's in my front garden. I've got two Indian hawthorns out there, uh, pyracanthas in that group, almonds, um, so many, so many plants. They're all, you know, um, they all have their issues. Don't plant 50 of the, some, you know, 50 roses in your landscape. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, get two or three uh, and then have a very diverse landscape around them. And I think you'll just have less issues overall. Um, rose gardens spray and they spray a lot. 
um, if you put that many roses together. Okay, let's see. Um... Uh, I'll take a couple more here. Somebody just asked me in general, a local nursery that sells Empress of China dogwood. I wouldn't, honestly, I, would, I just wouldn't know. I don't um, shop that much. That plant I've actually found at Home Depot more than any other place because um, uh, Flowerwood Nursery uh, grows a lot of the plants for the Southern Living Plant Collection and uh, they do um, Home Depots in, um, I've seen them in, you know, like it, they do all the Home Depots in Georgia and. Uh, that kind of thing and some of the lows and other places so uh, sometimes sometimes with some of these um, you got to look everywhere <laughs> not just not just your local garden center but this is the time of year and I think I may have said this in the last video this is a good time of year to go to garden centers because this is show season um, and uh, like the North Carolina show which I should be at uh, today is Wednesday I should actually be over in Greensboro today uh, at the North Carolina show but I, um, again just getting over uh, being sick so I'm not over there um, uh, what was I gonna say about the North Carolina <laughs> what was I gonna say about the North Carolina show like so if you went to a garden center now they will be they'll have they will have seen all what the nurserymen are gonna have uh, for this spring to offer them and they'll have their new list and that kind of thing so if you go to your garden center now this is pretty much anybody watching me uh, this is the time of year they probably are most familiar with what's going to be available to them so ask them now and see if they can order you one, um, if, if they've seen it at a nursery. Okay, um, somebody asked about software for design, uh, designing their landscape. I just use Google Earth. If you don't have access to a drone, a drone is number one. If you've got a neighbor, a friend, son, family member with a drone, uh, if you can put a drone up above your landscape and get a good photo of it from the drone, uh, that's good to have where you can, you know, then print it out and play with it um, or play with it on Photoshop or whatever uh, uh, that's a that's a good that's probably number one and then you can use google earth uh secondly and just take a photo you know you can go in <laughs> you know, very 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 close to your property kind of a disturbing just disturbing thing out there but yeah i would just use google earth to get a good photo of your of, above your landscape um and then uh last question for this week somebody said about when to do your winter sowing if you're going to do uh, seeds do that winter sowing technique in zones seven and eight totally depends on the seed that you're doing. If the seed, if you read the seed packet and it requires winter stratification, meaning it needs cold treatment, you can go ahead and put those things uh, in those jugs outside and uh, they won't germinate for a while, but they'll get the cold treatment that they need uh, in the meantime. If they don't need cold stratification, there's really no reason to start that seed more than the required time uh, for transplanting, uh, which will be on the packet. You'll look on the packet and it says, you know, from seed, um, if you're starting it from seed in a tray or a bucket or a, you know, a pail or whatever you're starting it in, how long before you transplant it into the ground? Usually that'll say four to six weeks, six to eight weeks, something like that. So uh, for me, I don't put any of those warm season things in the ground before April 15th. And so I'm just going to back up from April 15th. You know, if it says the seed takes eight weeks from seed to transplant, I'll back up eight weeks from April 15th. So that would be what, February 20th or something like that. Um, you know, February 5th, yeah, February 20th or something like that. So that's how you do it. Uh, you just back up from the day, from how, you know, read on the packet, how long does it take from seed till it's ready to be transplanted and just back that off from your frost free date, uh, which for me is about April 15th. Um, zone eight, about same, about same, April 15th, uh, and just back up from there. But again, if it needs cold stratification and you can read, you'll see on some packets, it'll say it needs some time to be chilled. You go ahead and do those uh, now. But um, if you start other things too early, you start, you, you, a lot of people just start things way too early. They end up stretched, um, out competing with one another, and it's kind of hard to recover from that. So um, patience on most of it. Thank you guys for watching, following along. You can ask questions down below. Um, thank you for all the participation in the uh, channel. And uh, uh, I have a lot of, I hope, good upcoming content here in the next few weeks. Thanks for watching.